All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Lasting Learning Podcast. Today is a, an extra special episode because uh, we have a guy on today who, I mean, I admire probably more than any other educator on this planet right now. He is truly one of my heroes. He's a guy that I look up to. Um, I, I'm lucky enough to say that a lot of people say that we actually look alike. We I don't know do. if that's true or not, or if I even <laughs> want to admit to that, but so, no, sorry about your luck here, man. But you are a guy that can pull off a tie, some fancy shoes, and still swear like a sailor and engage yeah. and inspire educators everywhere to constantly get better, do better, and be better, man. So Brian Mendler, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's good to see you. And just so you know, I want to be clear about this. I have worked hard over the last, like, really, I would say two to three years on my cussing. I, <laughs> I don't cuss anymore. And it's, it's I, 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 you know... My what I used to cuss a lot. It was it was actually a problem, and I you know it was the number one negative feedback that I got at seminars was that I would cuss, and I I was kind of young and I brash and I didn't care. And my wife was really instrumental in saying, "Listen, someday your kids are gonna watch you and and listen to you, and you have to you 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 don't you don't help yourself." She was very adamant that I don't help myself when I cuss. That if it offends one or two people, it's one or two people too many. So I have worked hard on that not being who I am, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> but Okay, so I, and we'll, we'll go there in a second, but I think it's also important for us to recognize the context behind it's all It's so that. effing hard, though. Let me be clear about that, all right? <laughs> so true, man. I hear you. I hear you. It's hard to, to be real and yet cater to an audience at the same time. It so. really is. So, so, Brian, can you just do, do me a favor and just introduce yourself to the world? There's there's yeah, I know you like people kind of doesn't know who you are. So yeah, I know you like you like when people do that. So basically, you know, I, I now what I do is I travel the country and I help teachers with their most challenging kids, right? So I was a teacher, I was a self contained special ed teacher, primarily in my career. And I worked with the, the, the I loved the, the most challenging population. Those were my favorite kids. And, you know, to me, there was nothing better than when everybody said a kid couldn't succeed and, and being, I'm not, I would ne never say be arrogant enough to say I was the reason that a kid succeeded, but being a fundamental piece of the reason, right? Being sort of the point guard orchestrating five or six teachers to come together to get a kid to graduate, you know, and, and then watching that kid walk across the stage to me, you know, there was no better feeling. It was, that was the ultimate success in life for me. And so I love that. And then, you know, I started getting to work with teachers and, you know, and, and now I, you know, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I'm, I, you know, up until this shutdown, I'm everywhere, you know, and now I'm here, which is cool, man. It's good to see you. We, we've been trying to do this for a while, you and I, right. so it's, I'm excited to be on here with you. I, I, I am super pumped, man. And <laughs> even, even if we had to rearrange the schedule five more times, I, we were going to make this happen. <laughs> no. I, I was going to fly to New York somehow, some way, even with the airport shut down to come and, and do this. So we, well, we they're not shut down like, yet. They're not shut down. The airports aren't shut down yet. So yeah. and I, who knows? I don't know if they show like part of me is like just shut it all down another right. part of me it's hard i go back and forth on this you know i i do what i do know is this okay and and i want to make this clear i i am i think that we as a society and again we're recording this and my views on this whole thing change daily so i want to be clear about that but at the time of recording this which is monday night I am, I want to point out to everybody. Let me, let me pause you real quick because your world has shut down. It's Thursday night, right? I'm sorry. My <laughs> bad. Why am I thinking Monday? It's Thursday night. It is Thursday night. Holy cow. So it's Thursday night. And, you know, we've been home for four days now with our right. kids. My daughter had a superintendent's conference day on the Friday before. So she's not been home for five days. And what I know is this is having a significant detrimental impact on our kids. And everyone's talking about, sacrificing for the elderly, which I'm fine with. I understand that. And I, I look, I love my grandma more than anything. And, but at the same time, I, I want to be clear. I keep seeing these posts on, on Instagram and on Facebook that we have to take care of our elderly, which are, which are our most vulnerable. Stop that. Do not insult me if I become elderly by calling me vulnerable, because I want to be clear, vulnerable. If I get to 85 years old, I'm, I'm, I'm durable. I'm a badass. I survived on this planet for 85 years. Don't ever insult me by calling me vulnerable. Let's be clear. The most vulnerable people in our society are our children. My six-year-old and eight-year-old who right now can't go to dance and can't go to their shows and, and, and kids that are having proms and, 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 and games and everything canceled. And again, I'm not 
judging whether we should do that or shouldn't do that. I want to make that clear. What I am saying is, I am saying this is having taking a tremendous toll on our kids. And at what cost? At what cost? If you came on to me and you said, listen, Bri, five-year-olds and seven-year-olds and six-year-olds are dying at an alarming rate from this disease, I would say, cool, shut the world down. But I'd, I, I'm, I'm looking at my own kids and man, they're starting to wig out and it's only been four days, you know? And so how, at what point do we look at the damage we're causing children? And, and I want to be clear, this is not, te teachers are doing, and uh, are you seeing what these teachers are doing? Uh, yeah. I, I can't yeah. comprehend what they're doing. It's what these teachers and administrators have done to basically take school from in-person to virtual online, bravo, and you should be commended and it will never replace school. Like that's what I've learned. The number one thing that I've learned from this is that we need school. We need the face-to-face -face interaction. My son and daughter need their friends. They need to be around their friends. They need to be doing their routines and their activities and to shut it all down. You know, when this changed for me, it was when I talked to my father. I, up until basically a week ago was, well, I tweeted it. You might've seen it. I yeah, tweeted, I we should shut all schools. My hashtag was close all schools, right? So I was 100% on board with closing schools and I still am, right? So right now I'm okay with it. I can live with it. But man, I just saw there were a couple states who canceled for the whole year. How utterly irresponsible of you. How irresponsible to close for the whole year. What? Like this is a fluid situation that no one knows what's going to happen. You got to be as ready to open school as you were to close it. And you closed it fast. Like people close these schools fast and they shut them down and they got kids online and ready to go. And you should be equally as ready to go the other way, right? Like this shouldn't be, it's closed for the whole year. It should be, we're going week by week. We're going week by week and we're seeing what's happening. And right now we deem it unsafe. Okay, I can live with that as a dad, but you know, for the whole year, I, if they did that, if they do that to my kids' schools right now, I will be enraged as a parent, enraged. Now, if, if you didn't have kids, you think you feel the same way? Uh, I, I don't know. You know, I know my dad does. So my dad's in his low 70s, right? So my dad is the population that we're talking about, right? He is yeah. the vulnerable man that we're talking about. And you know what my dad said to me today, yesterday? He said, I want to go on a cruise. He's like, <laughs> this is the most idiotic thing I've ever seen. That's literally what my dad said. He's like, he goes, y'all are trying to protect me. He's like, I'm 72 years old. He's like, I got three grown kids. I got seven grandkids. He goes, you think I want my grandson? I want to see my grandson cry that he can't perform in his show because you're afraid I might get sick. He's like, I mean, my own father is saying this to me. He's like, I am. He goes, it's not your job to protect me. It's my job to protect you. The father protects the kid right? That the kid doesn't, prefer. and so my, my own parent is the one who changed my mindset on this because he, if, look, if he doesn't care, right, if he's the one saying, go about your life, then I'm sitting here like, okay, cool. No, look, I get it. I get it, the precautions, and I, I think you can't, I think you can't win as an administrator, right? Because if you don't close school and bad things happen, you get crushed, right? If you close school, and you shut it down, you kind of, or, or, or it was never that bad. You can say, "Well, we took our our precautions," and I and I'm for that, right? So I so I, I don't I want to be clear. I don't think it was the wrong move to close school. All I'm saying is you got to be fluid here. This is a fluid situation where you don't make any drastic calls one way or the other until looking at all bits of information. And I, you know, it scares me when we're not doing that because I the thought of my two children being home for the rest of the year. Forget me as a parent, it would drive me nuts, no question as a parent, but for their own good, man, they need to be, you know this, kids need to be around their friends, they need to be around their teachers, they need to be around their sports and their music and their, 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 their you know, their dance and their shows and all the stuff that their, their, their graduation, I mean, we're talking about, you know, events in their life. You know, my father said to me, it's funny, he said, my, my, so my son, I'm passionate about this because my son is, um, He's a, um, he's a dancer, you know, so, so my son's eight and he likes to sing and dance. He's an arts kid, you know, he's, he loves arts and which I love and, and they've been doing Frozen. So he's been a part of Frozen and, and it got canceled. So last week got canceled two weeks before the performance. So they practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And, and then you, he asks you, he's like, dad, why are they canceling this? 
And, and you try to explain to an eight-year-old or six-year-old why they're doing this. It's, it's really hard. Like it's a hard. And so I'm like, well, there's, there's people that are getting a virus and they're getting sick. And my, my son's like, oh, well, don't people get sick a lot from a lot of different things? They don't close school for chicken pox or they don't. And, I, and I'm like, right, good point. And I'm like, well, it's like people like grandma and papa. And, and he's like, grandma and papa. Well, then why don't grandma and papa just stay home from the show? Like why? Why do we not have a show? Because they might get sick. And I'm like, and you're, you're trying to explain this to a kid. And it's, it's not an easy thing to explain. And then my father comes along and looks at my son. He's like, I wish you were in your show. It's ridiculous. You're not in your show. Like that, you should be in your show. I don't know why they're afraid of people like me getting. And so I'm, this is where kind of the world I'm in. And it's, you know, it's been, it's been both for me. I've had over the last week, a, a true, true roller coaster of feelings and emotions. And I still look my, the other side of the coin is my brother's a doctor and he's on the front lines of this whole thing. And you know, he's, he's immune compromised my brother already. Um, he's got a lot of autoimmune issues himself. And so he's worried about this and he's saying, you got to stop your activities right now. But then I'm saying to him, I know that may, that sounds good in theory, but then you go to the grocery store and everybody's touching everything. And doesn't it just defeat the purpose of everything we're doing? If, if you can go to the grocery store and everyone can do self checkout touching. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough spot. All I'm asking is that people look, really look at the damage this is causing kids as much as the potential damage this could cause the elderly and decide. Because I think sometimes in tough times, you have to pick the best of crappy options, right? It's like you kind of, sometimes that's true as a teacher, right? Sometimes with challenging kids with, in school, you look at a scenario and you're like, man, I don't have a lot of good options with this kid, right? I could let him keep his head down in my class class. Well, I don't really want to do that. I know, but I could kick him out or send him to the, I know, but I really don't want to do that. All right, let me let him keep his head down in my class. Well, why are you letting him keep his head down? Well, I don't like it. I'm not saying I like it. I don't like it. But when I look at all the other options, I'm like, oh, I guess it's the best of all of the bad options. And I think in this scenario right now with what's happening, there's a lot of really crappy options. I just hope we as a society, as a society decide to focus our thoughts on the best of those bad options. And you know me, man, for me, that is always doing what's best for kids. It's not doing what's best for anybody other than kids, whether it's grandparents, whether it's the sick people, whether it's you got to do what's best for kids. And for me, that's the generation that's going to propel everything forward. And so I want to just make sure that that's what all of us are in this to do versus, you know, anything else. Uh, first, you got of me all, off. first of all, let, let, me, let me compliment you. Went on that soapbox rant and not one cuss word, man. You, you have no, done it. <laughs> I was waiting for it. I was waiting to hit the, the drop button and didn't have no. to. And, and, and I, I want to be clear with people. Like I'm not, I'm not in any way minimizing this. Like yeah. I'm not saying I don't, but I am also a, not a hysterical person and I, I don't buy into hysteria and I, you know, I, I did never have, right? I also want to say something else. I've never been afraid of dying and I'm not going to start being afraid of dying today, yeah. right? I don't want to ever be afraid of dying. I want to live life. I want to travel and I want to get in an Uber and I want to go on an airplane and I want to go in the ocean. And I, this is the life I want to live. And if you're going to try to take that away from me, I'm going to say, well, I don't know if I, what's the even purpose then, right? What is the purpose? If, I, if everybody's so scared, of Brian getting sick, right? If, if we're going to make all of our decisions in our life with that being the focal point, I, I got to say time out. Like, I don't want you to do that for me, you know, in my life. And one thing about you, Brian, is you are consistent. I mean, you, you say your, your opinions have shifted a little bit, but you are consistent in the, the belief that it, it truly, you focus on kids first. Kids, 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 kids. Of course. Kids, all kids first. And, you know, I, I've heard your story. You've, you've talked about your story a thousand times in the classroom. You were that, that guy that you would fight for your kids, the kids that oftentimes were put in their little, they, they were, your, your kids have always been quarantined. The kids that you fight Correct. for. Correct. They, they've always been. Been <laughs> Absolutely. Social distancing was the reality when you started within your job. And you've always fought to break that mold for, for kids at the discomfort of adults. Correct. It's what, and it's what you still fight for. No question. And I find it super, super fascinating. So on the professional side, I mean, you, you swing for it. You, you, you are real, you're honest. You just shoot from the hip and you say, I'm unabashedly, unashamedly a fighter for kids. 
Well, well, here's what it is for me. What it is for me fundamentally is I don't want to waste your time, right? So, so I believe pe- the most valuable thing human beings have in the world is time, right? And, and so, you know, people don't have a lot of it. So I don't want to waste it. And, and, and for me, that's kind of the foundation of everything. It's let's just get to the point of what we're talking about because there's no sense wasting it. Like why? And it, by the way, I'm the same with life. Like I don't want to waste my days. Like I don't want to. I don't want to, and I know nobody wants to sit in their homes right now and do nothing. And we're all sacrificing because nobody is excited about this. I don't think all I'm saying is I hear a lot more chatter about how we're, we're saving the elderly, which I'm fine with hearing as long as we hear an equal amount of how we're destroying our young people at the same exact time. And, and so if we're okay with that, and I'm not, I want to be clear, like I'm not okay with it. I'm, I'm devastated by watching my children not be able to do their events and be a part of their, their, their world at the expense of quote unquote, trying to, you know, trying to save the elderly, which I, which I'm for, I think we should do that. But, you know, I just, we got to be careful is all I'm saying. We got to be careful because, you know, these kids, man, they're good. Some of these kids were talking about losing in like the entire last, four months of school. And it's, yeah. that's a lot of time we got there, dude, there's kids who go home and get their no disrespect or no, I don't mean to say to, no, to you're good. Know they get their asses kicked by their parents, literally get their asses kicked every day from the minute they get up to the minute they go to bed. You're going to tell me that kid can't go to school for the rest of the year. Cause you're worried about your 85 year old mother dying. That's the stupidest. Honestly, that's really ridiculous. And it's incredibly selfish. And I'm telling you the 85 year old mother would say, don't do that. I don't want you to do that. I want you to send that kid to school at the risk of me getting sick. And I, I, again, I know it's not that simple. I want to be very clear about that, but you know, as long as we're thinking about that kid every day that's going home and does, you know, doesn't have food and doesn't have, you know, th- that loving, you know, let's go on the computer and spend an hour together and then let's go read books and then let's go ride a bike and then let's go to the golf course, let's, which is what happened in my house today, right? With my kids and me. But the, you know this, man, there are multiple kids out there who don't have that at all. And so we got to be decision making for them as well. That's all I'm asking for is that we look at both of them equally and say, what are we doing to this group versus what's happening to that group? And then that doesn't even, by the way, bring into the mix, the economy and what we're doing to that. Right. So that's, so that's another piece of the puzzle that you got to add into the equation. When you add all of that up, you know, you got to decide everyone's got to make their their decisions. And I think we will see what happens soon. You know, it's a tough time. It, it, correct me if I'm wrong in this, but I feel like a lot of the passion that you're exuding right now, it's not new. I feel like what has happened is you've lived this reality for the last 25 years and now it's on the grand stage and everybody is kind of just marching to the same drum beat right now saying, put the kids in a bubble, protect the adults, right. put the kids in a bubble, protect. And you, you, that's the wall that you've been trying to break down <sighs> your entire career. Right. And now it's, it's on ridiculous. this global stage. Like I hate bubbles. Like I don't want to be in a bubble. Like, like no one wants this. Like who wants to live like that? You don't need to put bubble wrap around my, your 85 year old grandma. Your 85 year old grandma's a badass. Your 85 year old grandma started your whole family. Your 85 year old grandma is why you are where you are in your life, right? You don't need to protect. You're trying to protect her. She look at what she's done. And, And I'm saying this because I admire them, right? I look at the elderly as amazing like these people are have fought wars these people have been through every kind of hurricanes and and they're still standing they, they're still they're at they're at the end of their line saying i'm still here what's up right and you're, you're gonna slow them down and here's the here's, i went to walmart the other day right i'm all hunkered down I go to i go to walmart there's about 15 people age 70 or above hanging out just and i'm like they're they're living their life which god bless them they should if you, dude, if I get to 85, I swear on my life, you will not tell me to sit in a bubble and not do anything. If I make it that far, I'm going on cruises. I'm, I might even jump out of an airplane if I make it to 85. <laughs> I'm not going to do it at 43 with two little kids. But if I get to 85, I'm going to the hell with it. I'm going to skydive. I'm going to swim with sharks, right? I'm going to do everything that could potentially get me killed. Because why not, right? I oh. mean, I'm already 85. So, so, so let, me, let me talk education <laughs> real quick. I'm going to take a parallel here. Because I'm sure you've heard things like, so you, you go to schools all the time. I mean, a you lot. live life on the road and you're in schools. I'm sure you've heard from teachers who have said, 
man, I, I, I was that teacher that fought for kids my first 10, 15 years, but I've been in the classroom now for 35 or 40 years. I've earned my time now. Now it's my time to worry about me. The kids can fend for themselves. It's about me now. How do you, how do you break that down with, with educators that have that same argument? Uh, well, it's never about you. I mean, it's, it's never about you. It's not, but I mean, it's right. Like the minute you get in front of kids and you decide that you're going to dedicate your life to making their world better, it always becomes about them. I, I don't have any tolerance or patience for, for that. I, and by the way, that's what I, that's why I don't, I don't really think the question, how long were you in the classroom matters. I know a lot of people ask that of people. And I, I think it's an irrelevant question because it, it's so loaded and it's like, I don't do, I've seen teachers in their first year, right. With, be, way better relationships than some in their 40 and vice versa. Right? right. So the amount of distance of time in there doesn't matter. It's, it's all about connection and it's all about what you do to grow with that kid. And it's all about getting better yourself constantly, right? It's constantly looking in the mirror and always trying to improve yourself at every aspect. And you know, if you're, I look, I don't have a lot of room for you in my life. If you're that way, like I, if you're not that way, I, my life is about constantly growing. It's, it's partly why I'm going crazy right now because <laughs> it, I, I'm, I'm in a standstill and I don't really know how to be in a standstill. I'm not that kind of a person where you're the same, right? It's like, yeah. I see you're, you're like, you're like, I see you're, you're, so I, you're so much on social media right now that I feel like you're just like a squirrel walking around <laughs> so the house true, 400 man. miles an hour. <laughs> I see you just, you got, probably got your phone. You're like, I got to hit this. And then he hits that. And, you know, you're just like, I don't know what to do. It's the yeah. personality type that you have. And, and I'm the same way. And look, you know, part of me, part of me looks at this whole thing and I say, you know what, it's a little bit good for me because it's teaching me how to go through something tough and it's teaching me how to, you know, slow down and, and spend more quality time with my children and, and focus on, on that. But you know, the uncertainty of it all is, 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 and, and, you know, I see the stress that it places on my family, right? My wife, me, and, and, you know, in our livelihood, imagine kids who, you know, their, their dad works at GameStop or their, or their mom right. works at, you know, at, at, at Wendy's and these restaurants are closed and, and these kids can't, their parents can't go to work and there's no income coming in. And so the stress that provide that puts on the kid and then the parents complaining to the kid and they have a short temper and a short fuse. And, and, and so the kid does something and then the parent flips out and, you know, and it's, it's like, you gotta, you gotta just see, you gotta decide if it's all worth it. And I don't know. That's the hard part is I don't know, but you know, it's not yet to me worth it. It's not worth it yet to me what, what we've done. And, I, and again, I was the one who a week ago tweeted, close all schools. Yeah. So now I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I don't, was that the right move? Was it the right call? It definitely is not the right call to close them for the whole year. That's a crazy call. Whoever makes that call right now is out of their mind. I can't believe that's a real thing. Yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, I have a feeling it's going to be something that grows just because Do you of really? the politics involved with it. Yeah. Once, Do you think one most schools are going to end for the whole year? I, I feel oh, whether, whether it's right or wrong, that's, that's, that's what I'm hearing and that's what I'm feeling. So. If any of you are listening and you have any say in this, don't hurt our children like this. Right. You will destroy our children's lives, many of their lives to do this. This is preposterous. It, it, think about this for a second, what you're doing. And look, I get it. You're in New York City or you're in Seattle. You're one of these hotbed places, but Iowa or, or, or Wisconsin, or, I mean, you're talking about farms that are like a hundred miles apart sometimes. And y'all live social distance, distancing out there. So, I mean, to, I'm not, again, I'm not saying not to close them for, for a period of time, but to make that call now to close it for the whole year when there's no, there's no, you got to at least give it a time and see what develops and see what, what, what happens here before you just take that crazy drastic measure and, and harm a lot of kids in the process, you know? And, and again, I know your thoughts are evolving right now and you are a master of face-to-face -face interaction. I mean, you, you like to have boots on the ground. When you go do your, your workshops with teachers, you like to go into their classrooms even and talk to their kids and interact and see what's really happening. Do you have advice for any of us right now who are like freaking out because our relationships with our students and our, our schools right now, I mean, they're up in the air and we're just like in limbo land right now. What yeah, do we do? Well, the number one thing that I think in general is it's good to not freak out. And, and I'm not saying it's easy because there's yeah. no question that I have had some freak out moments over the last four days. Look, you know what I do. And so if schools are closed, I'm biased here too. So my, my opinion's biased. There's no question, right? My impact has been 
tremendous during this, right? I have lost multiple days and multiple work. And again, I'm telling you, I'm willing to sacrifice. I am willing to sacrifice, but I have to know specifically what I'm sacrificing for. And, and if you're going to tell me that I'm sacrificing it because potentially somebody might get sick, that's a hard pill for me to swallow. If you're going to tell me I'm going to sacrifice it because somebody definitely will get sick or a child for sure, I would say no problem. But you know, you got to be really careful about this. And I, so number one is don't get freaked out. And, and number two is I think, you know, really start at, you know, at looking at using your own children as the measuring stick and saying in general to people, when, are, when, when do they go back? Like we need a date that they're going to go back. And I believe you people should say it. I think people should say May 1st right now, May 1st, we're going back. And you know what, whatever's happening in society, elderly, get ready. We're going back May 1st, steer clear. If you're worried about it, steer clear your grandchildren from that day on for 14 days. If you're not sure what's what, but we are going back and we are living our lives starting May 1st. And our kids, you, you set a date. I think you alleviate the anxiety immediately from a lot of adults and a lot of kids because it's the not knowing that's killing people right? It's the not knowing. It's the unsure. And, and, and you don't take the drastic measure. You, what you say is May 1st or sooner. That's what you say. But by May 1st, we're going back. And if you, if you have the power to make that call, which some people don't, let's be clear. These are off, some of these are governor shutdowns where you don't have a say in what goes on as a local person, right? But it's, it's getting that back. And then it's, and then it's shifting your focus. Look, I am you know, I'm set up online, right? I do already. I do a ton of online consulting, a ton during the year. I probably do 30 dates a year just on the computer where I, I have a whole studio in my office. I have TV screens. I can literally stand right over here to my right and do a full presentation standing up. And it's like you're sitting in my audience, which is fantastic. So, so I'm, you know, I'm set up for this, but it's, it's about, it's about embracing. And I think they are right. I've seen what the teachers are doing right now is uh, it's spectacular, right? It's spectacular what they're doing and how fast they're learning new stuff. And, you know, but, but be careful. Like sometimes they go on social media and people are putting in, Oh, check out my new norm. No, like, don't ever let this be normal. This is not normal. And don't say that it's normal because it's not normal. It's, it should feel not normal. And you should never say that it feels normal because the minute you say it feels normal to me, you're kind of saying, well, if this is the way it is forever, that's no big deal. And it is a big deal, man. It is, it would be devastating to my children if you told them tomorrow that their school was canceled until the end of the year. And then they would look at their dad and say, daddy, why? Why is school canceled to the end of the year? And I'm telling you, I would not have a good answer other than there's a virus and some people are getting sick and dying. And they would say, but, but we're not. Like kids aren't right, I know. I don't know what to tell you. Other than I know we're, we're scared. We're a society that is living scared right now. And again, I don't live scared. It's never been my premise and I'm not starting today, you know, no, dude, no. I, 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 you know, I've figured out in the last two weeks or over the last week, why people would, would, would risk their own lives to escape a place like Cuba. Right. I never, I never, I'm telling you, I never knew. Like I would always kind of think about it. Like what could be so bad where you live, where you would risk getting on a boat, a rickety boat, trying to travel across shark infested waters in the middle of the night 98% chance that you'll end up dead or drowned, right? Eaten or drowned. And you're still willing to take that risk. I've figured that out over the last four days. When you tell me that I can't hug people that I love, when you tell me that I can't say, shake someone's hand, and again, I'm practicing this because this is what society is telling me to do and I'm doing it. But I don't, if that, this, don't ever let this be my new norm. Let me be clear about that because I don't ever want this to be my norm people walking up to you, not sure who you are, looking at you like, you know, do you have some kind of crazy, I don't want that to be the norm, man. This isn't the norm. This norm sucks. You know, <laughs> it does. It's terrible. And, and again, right? you, you are, you are consistent if nothing else, man, because again, it's, it's like you've, you've taken your, your reality from schools and you're seeing it at play now truly worldwide, not just, not just in New York, not just America, worldwide people are, are doing this, this thing that has just aggravated the crap out of you for so many years. You know, you talk, you've told stories about your, your kids, your students back when you were in the classroom, your teacher, when you were a teacher. 
and how you would interact with your kids like nobody else would. You, you treated them like they were normal, man. You, you had real relationships yeah. with them and everybody else kind of just excluded them and said, leave those kids. Not alone. everybody. Those kids don't, but, well, <laughs> not everybody. But yeah, I mean, look, look, when you're a self-contained special ed teacher, you live on an island, right? You live yeah. on an island. You're the, you're the quote unquote redheaded stepchild of the school district. You are, you're the, you're the forgotten, right? You're look, we, we think about it. Self-contained special ed, we cost you a lot of money and we provide you zero glory, right? right. We, we don't provide, we don't get it, win any awards or any, right. But we cost a lot. So we're not the we're not the group that everybody's loves and everybody's clamoring toward. We're we're the group that's often a pain in the butt. And so you kind of live on this island. And it doesn't mean there aren't people who come to the island sometimes to visit, or there are, right? But you know, for the most part in a school, you, you kind of do your thing, you know, which I like. I that was my one of my favorite parts of the job was they kind of leave you alone down there, which is cool. But yes, I'm consistent and I fight for those kids. I those are my kids. And, and, you know, my thought is when, again, same back to closing a school, when you close a school, you got to think about the one who's going to be harmed the most, right? Yeah. That's who you think about. Same when you plan a lesson, think plant, plan it for your most disruptive kid, not your, not your least disruptive plan it for your most disruptive. When I teach a seminar, my mindset is who is the most squirrely ADHD person in that room that hates staff development okay, cool. I'm planning my seminar for them because I know if I reach them, of course I'll reach everybody else. And, and, that, and that's exactly where I was going with this is that, I mean, you, you fight for those people that might be forgotten about if you're not bringing their voice to the table. And yet, I mean, you're out there right now and you are truly killing it. You're like the James Brown of education. You are the hardest working man in show business or in education right now. You mm -hmm. are just everywhere. And people they, they crave your words. They crave your wisdom because they know it's true. And where did you get to that? Where'd you get that comfort to say, I'm just going to continue to be real and be true. And I'm not going to just cater to the masses, if you will. I'm not just going to well, cater to what society says. It's just, it's just so, right. It's sort of like that triangle of success, confidence, and competence, right? So I, one of the things I teach teachers is think of a clock, right? And instead of numbers in the clock, where the 12 would be, you have the word success, where the four would be, you have the word confidence, and where the eight would would be you have the word competence and think of a little ball that spins between those three words because in life those three words are breeders of each other they breed each other right the more success you have the more confident you become when you become confident you start to become more competent at what you're doing the more competent you are the more success you have and it's like this incredible cycle that once you're in it is almost impossible to get out. The problem is many kids have never tasted any of those three things, right? They don't know what success is, they don't know what confidence is, and they don't know what competence is. And sometimes as a teacher, you have to shove them into that cycle. And it's the same, been the same thing for me, right? It's kind of like you say something and you realize, wow, that resonated with people. And you know, look, I think my opinion right now on what I'm saying with the with the outbreak, I think it's not a popular opinion. Let me be clear. Like I think people, some people are going to listen to that and I'm going to get some blowback and people are going to say, you know, you don't care about old people and you don't, you know, you're not compassionate and you're not kind. And I, and I see that side of it. I do like, I see how you could say that, but, it, but all of my compassion and kindness is focused on children. It's not focused on elderly. It's focused on children. And so I think you're, when it comes to the elderly, in this case, you're right. Like I'm, I have less, a lot less compassion than I do for seven and eight year old people that can't go to their show or their, or their, or a 15 or 16 year old who can't go to their prom because you're afraid your grandma might get sick. Right? So it's not that I don't have compassion. I absolutely do, but it's which direction do you put it? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. And, and, and it, and I told you, it's about not wasting people's time, you know, and it, and it's about not being boring. That's the other thing. It's like, you know, I tell people all the time who ask about staff development, my number one rule is don't be boring. <laughs> like, you know, be, be entertaining, be engaging, be controversial, be aggravating, be it, be it, you know, be whatever you need to be, but just don't bore me. Right. It's Howard Stern says it best. I don't care if you love me or hate me as long as you listen to me. Right. And it's, it's a, it's a, I'm not telling you I love Howard Stern. He's okay. I used to listen to him more when I was younger, but you know, I, that mindset is sort of what I go in with. And you know, if you're always fighting for kids, you know, the other thing about me is I get paid to come in and shake things up. I mean, that's, that's what I get paid to do. I, and it, and I'm an equal opportunity shaker. I mean, I'll come, I'll go at the administrator as hard as I'll go at the teachers. And it's, it's all about just making everybody better. And everyone, you know, Carol Dweck's, 
growth mindset. It's about taking the growth mindset and taking that to a whole other level. And it's, it's about pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. One of, my, one of my quote unquote famous lines is discomfort is always the appetizer for growth. Like you can't grow in the world without feeling discomfort first. And that's true both physically and emotionally. And, and I, I think that's true with the outbreak right now with the virus. I, I think in the long run, this is going to be good for a lot of people. I think this is going to shake people to their core and it's going to remind them what's important in life. And it's going to, it's going to humble them and it's going to make them say in one second, everything you have can be changed or gone. And that's a, that's a humbling experience. If you go through something like that in your life, you come out different, you know, the other yeah. side. And, and I think sometimes when things hurt a lot in the short term, they're actually really good for you in the long term. And I think vice versa is also true. I think sometimes things that feel amazing in the short term are often really bad for you in the long term. But it's going through those things in the short term that, is, that can be really hard and, and painful, you know. Yeah, and- it's the same with kids. And you're and you're speaking from experience. I mean, you you've you've been there. Your your life hasn't been all sunshine, rainbows, and uh, no. <laughs> unicorns flying. My yeah. life has. My school life hasn't. Right. So my my home life has. What what's one of the what's made me successful is I have a very stable home life, and 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 it's proof that 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 it's it's a bad word to say in any context, but that trumps anything else, right? Like home life trumps anything else. It it truly does, and it you, you know this, right? Whether you know, look, my daughter's teacher who, who I don't want to call her out, but I am because, you know, she's, she's, I have not, we have not gotten one assignment. We have not gotten one phone call. We have not gotten one email, literally not one bit of communication from my daughter's kindergarten teacher. My son's second grade teacher has been like, you like, she, you can't even believe what she's every morning with a personal greeting to every kid, right? On Seesaw every kid. So my son wakes up in the morning excited to go on Seesaw and play his greeting from his teacher saying, Hey, good morning, Eli. I miss you so much. I can't wait to see you again when school returns. And I hope you're doing great. And, you know, be kind to your sister today and make sure you're good to your parents. And I mean, she's doing that, you know, and and then throughout the day, like he's posting videos and, and stuff on Seesaw and she's commenting throughout the day saying, I love your work. It looks so great. My son did an hour and 20 minute project today on Harriet Tubman. That was directly from his teacher, right? Wow. Did it all at home, did it on the iPad, was reading a book at the same time. And his teacher was involved. She was involved. She was commenting. She was, right? And so you see right now, people are separating themselves from other people. And it's, it's how willing are you to use technology? How willing are you to embrace it and hug it and let it be a part of your life? And I think what's going to end up happening long term from this is this is going to be good for a lot of people because it's going to prove to them how actually easy technology is that they were so afraid of. And it's going to change their life when they go back to the classroom because they're going to be able to do so many more things. I'm even in the same boat. I, you know, I, you know, I'm in addiction recovery. And, um, and so I was thinking Monday night when I said Monday earlier, Monday night was my recovery meeting and I did a zoom, right? So I had never done a zoom recovery meeting, but we can't go to the, the, the place where our meeting is, you know, it's at a place of worship and those are all closed and, you know, people need meetings, man. That's another thing. So how about the, that's a, how about the addicts out there that can't get to a meeting now because we got to think about them, right? The same way we're, but you know, but, um, so I, so I did a zoom meeting and, and what I realized was. You know, I, I was staying in the shower after and I thought to myself for all these years, you know, I've, when I've been traveling on a Monday, I haven't been at my meeting and that will no longer be the case. That will no longer be the case. From this moment forward, I will always be at a meeting, whether I'm in, you know, Michigan, you I'm go. in, you know, California, I'm in Rochester. Not only will I be at a meeting, I'll be at my meeting because I'm going to have Zoom and I'm going to have someone hold their phone at, at the meeting, just hold it there. And I'll be able to be in an airport with my headphones on and be at a recovery meeting because I just did one the other night where one lady was in Florida and another lady was at her house and another guy, right? And so I'm, I think everybody's going to come out of this with new skills, with, with stronger abilities. And I don't think that that could be a bad thing. I just think the only thing we have to be very careful about is what kind of damage are we doing to our kids in the yeah, process of making sure. this happen. For sure. You know, and you're exemplifying the idea that some people look at things like this and they say, these obstacles, we just can't overcome them. Other people say, no, I've got other things that are more important than this. And it becomes an opportunity. You know, you talk about your kid's second grade teacher and that teacher knows that relationships with kids comes before anything, anything. else. No, no silly virus is going to keep that teacher away from kids. And she's out there learning whatever she's got to learn 
to go out there and form those relationships and other people are now using it like, okay, well, I guess I get some time off now. And Correct. it, it, it magnifies current reality is what well, it's frustrating as a parent, yeah. right? I'm speaking as a parent and I'm like, look at what my son is doing. And my, we haven't even, you, you're, my daughter's teacher not even said good morning. Like you're not even, you, it's like, I mean, shouldn't you send some kind of message and say, Hey, just want to let you know, I'm thinking about you. I miss you guys. We love you. You know, sorry, you're not in school. We hope we, this ends soon. And we get, I mean, give me something, right. But like <laughs> nothing every day. I mean, the, you know, there's no, I don't mean to be rude, but there's no excuse for that in this world right now. Yeah. I mean, it's too easy to be able to communicate with people from anywhere you are to not at least give something like that. And the kids notice, man, you think my daughter doesn't see her brother getting those messages. She sees it and she's yeah. like, what about me? And so, you know, be careful teachers. Cause other teachers are going to make you look bad. You know, don't let that happen. Like push yourself to be as good as the person next to you or around the corner. And I never think that's a bad thing anyway in a classroom or in school, you know? Do you, do you think teachers in your kid's school are playing not it? Like not in I'm Mindler's kid next year. Um, because it, with my own kids, I've got four kids and I'm not allowed to talk at parent teacher conferences because I tend to ask the questions that tick everybody off. You know, and I get my hand slapped often as I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm wondering, you got so, me beat, bro, because I'm not even allowed to go to parenting. <laughs> so, so this is my this is my wondering. So, like, what's going to happen as the years go by, man? Um, yeah, you-, you know, I'm actually pretty good. With my kids, I've been lucky, man. My kids have had. And look, I want to be clear. I know it sounded. I love my daughter's teacher. Like I, he's she's had her for three years. This is her yeah. third year having her in the class, and she is the epitome of what you would want for a kindergarten teacher in school, right? She greets the kids at the door. She's a you know what a kinder you know how some people were just born to teach kindergarten, right? It wasn't so me. You, wasn't me. But <laughs> no, no, no. Right, I say this all the time, like. You know, difference. I mean, elementary teachers are God, like God's middle school teachers and high school teachers, no disrespect, but you can't handle a kid for 45 minutes. Come on, 45. These elementary teachers got the kids for five hours and you can't handle 45 minutes. You got to be kidding me, right? Like you think elementary teachers want to hear you cry that you can't handle 45 minutes when they got them for five hours. And how about this? The older kids will cuss you out. The little kids will hug you and leave snot trails on your stomach. <laughs> no, thank you, man. Give me the F you over the snot trail all day long. True story. Right? But I mean, look, we love her and she's an amazing person, an amazing teacher. But, you know, you see, look, some people transition quicker than others. And, you know, some people are better prepared than others for things. And I look, I don't I want to be clear. I don't think people could have prepared for this. I didn't prepare for it. I didn't prepare for it. I I was blindsided by this. I, I sort of saw it coming last Thursday where I kind of was I went to Alabama and I got back from Alabama and I started thinking, I don't know if I'm going to be working for a while anymore. And then they closed my kids school. And then it was just like this crazy domino effect of one after another after it's kind of like somebody, you know, one kid does it, they're all going to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the same sort of mindset in schools. Well, we did it. So you're going to do it. And I hope that doesn't happen with the end of the year stuff though. I really hope that doesn't happen. I mean, that would be, uh, I don't, I, it makes me physically sick to think about canceling school for the rest of the year and what you do to these children. If you do that. Yeah. And, and kids are the most important thing in our society. And grandparents will tell you that they will tell you, don't harm my grandchild for my sake. Please don't do that. Do everything you can to make my grandchild's life better. Even if it's at the expense of me, that's why the old elderly are badasses because they put everybody else first. Right. And so I get the concept of putting them first for a while, but not indefinitely. We cannot do that indefinitely. That is a very dangerous thing for us to do for our society. I'm scared, man. It makes me nervous when you think, when you tell me that you think it's coming, that all, that, that, that all the states are going to cancel for the whole year. It yeah, makes, it, I hope that does not happen. And I'm optimistic it won't, but you think it will. Well, I, I hope I'm wrong. I, I really am. I, I hope that some people are listening to this and they look at me like I'm a complete idiot. You agree because- with me, by the way? I, yeah, in a large part, I do. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's not the popular opinion. It's, no, it, it's, it's not, it's not, especially not right now. It's a, it's a struggle and I'll just be real. So my, my current reality, I, my parents lived down in Florida where, where I lived for a few years and went down there to be by my parents. Cause my dad is, my dad is vulnerable. If you yeah. will, I'll, I'll use that word because he's, he's, he's got some health struggles. Yeah. But he, 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 also he has probably wouldn't struggles. want you to call him vulnerable though. He'd probably oh, want you to call him. So a, true. A and, I, and exactly. So that's my I, point. I, I included him on a text the other day with my mom and we were talking about the situation and my mom responded back with, I'm just trying to keep your dad healthy. 
he gets on the phone and he calls me real quick and put me in my place. Like, how dare you guys talk right. about me like that behind my back? I'm on this thread. I can handle my own stuff. Healthy. Who are, who are <laughs> you to tell me what I can or cannot do? We were supposed to go down there for spring break to see him and we canceled the trip because we didn't want to expose him. He's like, what are you doing? Get your kids down here I, to see me. I could die tomorrow of a heart attack and I would rather die of a heart attack tomorrow having seen my grandchild child than not. This yeah. is what they're all saying. Yet yeah. all of us are making all of our decisions based on this. And look, I, I understand it the other side. My, you know, I told you my brother's a doctor and he's on the front lines of this and he's, he's autoimmune. Did I tell you this? Yeah, or no? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he, so, so he's, you know, but at the same time, I'm sitting here like, I hear you, bro. I hear you. And I'm not saying that I don't feel for you. In fact, I feel very much for you. But tell me again why my daughter can't go to gymnastics because of that. My, you're t my daughter can't go to gymnastics because, wait, why again? I'm still, I'm still not understanding why my daughter can't go to gymnastics. Like, why can't she? And when she keeps asking me why she can't go, after a while, it's a really hard thing to answer. When you're like, yeah. because someone might get sick. It, it, like it's it, right. I mean, I, I I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. <laughs> no, I don't. I I you know. I think the the bottom line is that neither one of us knows no right or wrong in any of this. We just see what you, we see in front of us with absolutely. our kids. Absolutely. But I think you bring up a, a powerful point here: is that we can't always just be lemmings either. We've got to ask the questions, no matter where we are in our world. We got to ask the questions: why Why is this acceptable? Why is this the norm? Is this what's really best for the kids? We can't just accept it as reality because somebody told us so, or somebody wearing a suit said it's the rule or the law or right. the expectation. It's okay to ask the questions. And well, challenge. look, and, and when you go, when you then add in the economy piece, right? So, so not so we've just talked basically about the kids piece, right, and what this is doing to children. But when you add in the economy piece, right? I have a buddy who lost his bar, right? So he owns a bar. He doesn't serve food at his bar. He just had a baby, right? So he's on the phone with me. We have a group, you know, chat with all my college buddies, right? And he's, he's asking us, he's saying, I just lost my entire livelihood. You're telling me 23, 24 year old kids can't come have a beer on St. Patrick's day because your grandma might die who's 85, this is what he's saying to me. And I, I'm, 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 I'm like, I hear you. Like, I'm not telling you you're right or wrong, but when you look at it from that lens of he's losing his livelihood, his livelihood is, is in major trouble because of this. I'm not saying he's not willing to sacrifice it, but I'm telling you, he's not willing to sacrifice it for his grandma who's sick. He's willing to sacrifice it for someone else. He's not the other way. And so, you know, my friends are struggling, man. I have real friends who own restaurants and I have a buddy who owns an insurance agency. You'd think insurance would be foolproof in recession times. 70% mm. of the businesses that he insures are restaurants. All of his restaurants are going out of business. Wow. Literally one after another, after another, after another is going out of business because no one's allowed to go out to eat, you know? And so when you ask, well, why am I not allowed to go out to eat? Because someone might get sick if you go out to eat. He's not interested in that as an answer. He does not like that answer. His answer is, yes, so what? Then don't come out to eat. If you think you might get sick, then don't, then choose not to come. That's your choice. You have every right not to, but you're going to stop everyone else from coming. And, and that's what his argument is. And, and look, less than a week ago, I did not feel this way. And now that I hear him say that, and I see what's happening to so many other people and the extra burden that it's putting on children. I'm pushing myself more and more that way. Now, maybe I won't feel that way in a couple of days. There's a chance that I won't. There's a chance that this thing might be so crazy and so big and so out of control and killing so many people. And, and, and I see the pictures in America of, 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 of people in respirators in the hallway and in the tents and that I might say, gosh, thank goodness we did this. But I'm, it's not, I'm not there yet. You know, let me be clear. I'm not there yet. Right now I'm saying every morning I'm waking up saying to my wife, check the news. And, and I'm saying, where are they all? Where are the cases? Because what look every day, look at the harm we are definitely doing to our children. We are definitely for sure harming them. And so if we're harming them, where, what is the sacrifice? And it has to be clear at some point, it has to be made clear what that is. And it's not yet to me, you know, it's not. And I think that's a scary thing to, 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 to have be as, as, as the foundation of our society. And I'm not the only one, right? You see that the, the, the market has tanked and I mean, everything is, you know, people have literally lost their, their livelihood, you know, because of this. I know multiple people who are in serious financial hardship right now because of the last 
four days of their life. You it, know? It, it is interesting when we talk about the opportunity cost involved when we're trying to protect the, the elderly or the most vulnerable who Correct. often depend on the stock market for their income and right. in our attempt to protect them, we've now cut off their legs, if you will. They don't need they don't us to protect them. Really, yeah. They don't need us. They've been alive for longer than us. They, yeah. that's, that's proof that we don't need to protect them. They have survived. They continue to survive. They live through the Holocaust. They live through, these are people who have lived through un, more than you and I will ever know. That's why it annoys me when we're trying to, because they don't want this. Like your dad is like, dude, get away from me. Right. My, my, you know, my mother, so my mother's panicked, right? I think I don't know what it is if it's a grandma versus grandpa thing, but my mother is, she buys into the hysteria. She watches all the news reports and she gets all freaked out all the time. And again, I'm not saying right or wrong, but you know, today we're at the canal, we go for a walk and you know, my children were looked at Papa, my, my, my mom and dad were there and my kids were there and they, they were, it was like, we went this morning. So it was like 1230. And of course, you know, it's like these whole days of trying to figure out what to do. And everyone's kind of banging their head against the wall. And you know, everyone's comical. These people posting their, their colorful schedules. Stop. Like you're so full <laughs> of it. Nobody is doing it. You're not doing it. You're, you're you, after the first 20 minutes, you realize the kid didn't even brush their teeth when they were supposed to. And that was on the schedule. Like stop. Right. And so you, you get, to, and, and they look at Papa and they're like, Papa, are you coming over? And grandma's like, absolutely not. And, and Papa's like, what? What do you mean I'm not? Yes, I am. And grandma's like, no, not if you're living with me. And Papa's like, I am coming over. And like, I don't care. Like, I'm coming over. I'm not living in a, in a bubble wrap society. And, you know, and I, God bless them, man. That's exactly, that's the mentality I have. My sister, I talked to my sister yesterday and, you know, she, she, was, she, was, she lives in New Rochelle, which is, New Rochelle is the epicenter yeah. of the, the coronavirus for New York State, right? It's where there was one man who infected, he looked, tracing back, he infected like a whole bunch of people. And they live right near that guy. My, bro my sister and um, brother-in-law were both tested, both tested negative. But my sister knows multiple people who have this. And, you know, and, and, you know, she's, she, you know she, she was freaked out at first, but then she said, she's like, Brian, I know seven people who have it. Four of them literally did not ever have a symptom. They were only tested because they were known to be in contact with that original person. So they tested them and they were found positive, but they had no symptom, which, which is the case, right? A lot of people get this and they literally end up never showing symptoms, which I guess is kind of the dangerous part of it, right? At the same time, two of them were sick, but not brutally. Like they were just had kind of sickness for about four to five days. They were better. Um, one of them who was a 70 year old guy who my sister said already had a lung condition is in the hospital on a ventilator, but he is expected to make a full recovery. So I'm talking about ground zero. She's in ground zero. She knows seven people. Not one of the seven is going to die, right? Only one of the seven even went to the hospital. And, and, and I'm like, wait a minute, why aren't they in school again? Like, it's a hard thing for me to wrap my head around. You know what I mean? And, but, but, you know, again, I wasn't, that's not how I felt a few days ago. So I, you know, I, I, what, what I am consistent about is that I'm willing to change my mind and I'm willing to look at new information and new, but you got to convince me. You can't just try to scare me. I'm not a person who's going to be scared. So if you're going to go come with me with, with showing me pictures of Italy, I don't want to see Italy. And the reason I don't want to see Italy is because in Italy, everybody smokes and in America, everybody doesn't smoke. And that's a huge difference. This is known to be killing people with lung disease, right? In Italy, everybody lives on top of each. You ever been to Italy, right? The streets of Italy. I mean, one of the, the, the cities is, is, is a water city, right? It's Venice. It's literally people live on top of each other. So the the closeness of the quarters and the ability to spread it, it's a different world, right? So if your only argument is you're going to show me pictures of that and you're going to say, this is going to happen in America, I'm going to say, well, I don't, okay, maybe it is. I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm not, you know me, I'm not one of those people that jo just goes along with what everybody says because everybody says it. In fact, I'm the opposite. What everybody says because everybody says it, I pick it apart at every moment and I look at every single flaw in it. And then I expose those flaws and I say, but what about this? And what about that? And what about the other thing? And I wish more people did that. And a lot of people in education just go along with the flow. Well, this is what we're doing. I've, you know, this is not your new norm. People don't say that you're not, this is not normal. You don't want this to be normal. You don't want to allow yourself to think this is normal. It's not normal. And, and the minute we start saying it is, we get comfortable with this life. And you should never be comfortable with kids being home when they're supposed to be in school, 
right? They're supposed to be in school. They're, it's Right now should be like self-contained special ed always is, right? And when self-contained special ed, you always have one eye on getting the kid back into the regular class, right? Your other eye is on doing the best you can for them where they are, but you're always trying to think about how do I get them back into regular society? How do I get them? And that should be the same mindset here. Everybody all day should have one eye on when are we going back? When are we going back? And that should be the focal point that people are taking versus we're all just going to sit around and wait, wait for somebody to get sick. I, it's not a life I want to have, you know, mm -hmm. neither do you, by the no, way, I no, know I, you, you're going nuts. Nobody does. Nobody does. You're absolutely right. And it, it's kind of funny how things play out because when, when I first reached out and said, man, we got to do something like this. This isn't the direction I, I thought our conversation was going to go, but I'm so, but I am so glad it did. I mean, I hate the, the circumstances surrounding it, but I, yeah, I think, I think the, the idea that something like this was just able to allow you to just get up and, and preach, man, and just share your heart and share who you really are. Uh, again, yeah. unashamedly and just say, this is, this is my truth, man. This is my reality. This is what I feel right now. This yeah. is what I feel right now. What I feel right now, I feel, you know, I look, it's a funny story. I went, so last week I went, there's a gym that I belong to here in Rochester for a long time. And I was caught up for a while in the hysteria and, and everybody was closing everything and they were not closed, right? So the gym was not closed and I was annoyed that they weren't closed. I felt like they should have been, they were still doing spin classes and yoga classes. And I was thinking, you guys are spreading this thing. Like it's bad. You shouldn't be doing this. And, 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 and all along my thought was rightfully we're trying to protect vulnerable people, right? We're trying to protect elderly people, vulnerable, sick people, right? And so I went to the gym to cancel. So I, so I have a locker at the gym. So I decided I'm canceling my membership and I decided I'm going to join a gym that's not open, right? I'm going to support somebody who closed for the good of our community, right? This is my mindset when I'm going to the gym. So then I get to the gym and I get to my locker and I clear out my locker and I go to the, the business office to tell them, right? That I'm, you know, and, and she says, well, why? Like, what's your reason for leaving? And I tell her, I say, because I'm annoyed that you're still open. I don't think you should still be open. I think it's bad for our community and the community should come first. And she said, okay. She said, I appreciate you telling us the truth. And then I go to leave the gym, right? And as I'm walking out, I kid you not when I tell you, there were probably 12 to 15 people, age 70 or more, doing dumbbell presses, <laughs> doing bench presses, running on the track. And I looked her, I thought to my, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just quit this place because I'm trying to keep those people safe. And those people are here having a party, right? Working out, which God bless them, right? If I ever get to be that age, I'm going to the, you ain't stopping me from going to the gym. Think you're going to stop me from going to the gym? Think you're going to stop me from my routine at McDonald's if I hit age 82? No, sir, right? I mean, my family, we got heart disease in my family. We lucky to make it to age 80 or 85. If you make it that far, you're already living on borrowed time. You know, live every single second you have to the fullest. And I believe that should be done at all ages, right? At all ages, live every single second that you have to the fullest. Go on that trip. Go on that trip to Florida. Go see your father. You never know if that will be the last time your kids will ever see your father, right? Mm -hmm. Support that airline. Support that hotel. Support that small business restaurant. Stop living scared, man. Living scared doesn't help people in this world. It hurts them more than it helps them. And I fully believe that. And I might believe that I'm wrong after I listen to this and I might get <laughs> crushed after listening to this. But look, I don't, you know, on my show, you know, I try to let the guests sort of go on the, 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 the rants, and the, you know, but I needed to get this off my chest. I, I feel strongly about this. I, you know, I'm, I'm hurting for my children and I know it's not just my children. I'm seeing all the kids on my street and they're going for walks with their parents and they're wondering why can't we play with the kid next door? Like, and they, and they want to just ride their bikes with each other and they want to have this life. And, you know, I just, I, it hurts me that, that they're not able to do that. And I, so I'm emotional about that and I'm passionate about that. And I, I'm willing to sacrifice, but I'm not willing to sacrifice forever. Let me be clear about that. Not with what we're sacrificing. My job is to take care of my children. That is my number one job as a father is to take care of my children. It is to make my children's lives better. That is the number one responsibility of being a parent. The number two responsibility of parent 
being a parent is taking care of your parents, right? But it's not number one, it's number two. And so when you look at number one versus number two and what we're doing here, you got to just be careful is all I'm asking everybody. I'm asking everybody to not get brainwashed. I'm asking everybody to stay informed, to really look at the situation for what it actually is. And we don't know. I'm not saying we know what it is because I don't think we do yet. I think it's early. I do think school should be closed till April 1st right now, for sure. I have no problem with that with my children. Keep them home for another two weeks. Let's see how this thing plays out. But then let's start looking at this as, you know what, we're going to live, man. Let's teach our children to live and to, and, to, and, to, you know, and, to, and to get out in that world and make something of themselves and to not be afraid, you know, to, to try something new and that they, something might go wrong in their life because they're taking a risk. Like, no, man, you take that risk anyway because, you know, there's a lot of good that can come from that same risk. And so, you know, for me, that's, that's who I am. And that's, that's what I'll always be. And I, that's what I want my kids to be. You know, what do you want for your children? I'm going to get emotional talking about this because I want my children, you know, I don't know, man, I'll never do that. As, as if I ever, God bless it. I, if I ever get to be 80 or 75 or, or, you know, I will always say to my kid, I'll sacrifice for you. You do not have to, you, you get to go do your thing. I will be the one who has to sacrifice whatever I have to sacrifice so that you're happy, right? Isn't that why we have kids and why we raise them, why we raise them? so we can make their life better? And, and I feel like right now we're really, we're, we're teetering on the brink of, of, of per, a lot of damage to, to a lot of these kids. You know, and my son especially, like he's, you know, my son's not, a, not a, a super social kid. Like he needs school. He needs to go to school to be around kids and to, to learn how to interact with them and to, you know, to push those friendships. And, and he's not getting that right now. And he's missing out. Like he is missing out and I'm okay with him missing out, but I'm not okay with him missing out for the rest of the year. That is unacceptable for people to do. And I can't believe it's happening. It should not be allowed to be happening. Not yet, at least. You know, we get to April and you start showing me all these problems. I'll say, okay, but not yet. Come on, guys. Like, we got to be smart about this. You were smart about closing them. Be equally as smart about when it's time to open them. And don't be scared, man. Don't operate out of fear. You know, fear is when you work out of the emotion of fear, usually decisions are made that are clouded in, in emotions. And I want decisions to be made always in the side of what's best for children. If you can look me in the eyes and tell me it is absolutely best for these kids to close school for the rest of the year, then I'll say, okay. But if you're telling me that it's only best because you think other people might get sick and our hospitals might get crowded, I'm going to look at you and say, no way. That is not a good enough reason. It's not good enough for me. You know, and I, I, I'm sorry. It's, I get it that it sounds ruthless, but I'm not trying to be ruthless. I'm just trying to show you that I care more about this side of, of me than that side of me, right? There, I'm in the middle. I'm the, I'm the dad at 40. And I had a buddy tell me the other day, he's like the guy who lost the bar. He goes, you know, he goes, what's funny is everybody wants to save the elderly. You're going to have a bunch of 40 year old people with kids jumping off bridges. You're going to have people commit. These pe people are out there losing their life and they're going to commit suicide because of it. Do you want that on your conscience? Does anyone want that to happen? Because when the economy goes the way it's going now and people go to lose everything, they get depressed and they get sad and you see a whole different level of death in other places. And so you know, again, I never thought of that either until he said that. And I was like, geez, you know, I didn't know people were taking this that hard. And he's like, well, I am. He's like, look, I got life insurance. I could end it, right? This is my buddy's son. I could end it. And my daughter will be taken care of for the rest of her life. He's not going to do that. Let me be clear about that. He's not going to do that. But the minute he said that, I was like, geez, there's people who put, might do that, you know? And at what cost? You know, that's always the, the question is at what cost? So anyway, man, I appreciate you. You're the best. Oh, man, it's good you, to see you, man. You are for, for sure. And I, I am, I'm super grateful that you have a microphone that is completely anchored to something there because, you know, it was mic drop after mic drop after mic drop in this thing. You were just, <laughs> I hope. We'll see. <laughs> I mean, I might, I might've just shot myself in the foot a couple of times, but you never know. I've done that multiple times. No, you, you are truly the best man. And I just, I Thank appreciate you. you just being so real and so passionate all the time. You mind just throwing out one more time to, to people. How do they connect with you 
and he's yeah so i try to my i try to make myself very accessible you know you're probably one of the people who makes themselves more accessible than me because i see you more everywhere than i see myself but you know i'm you can get me anywhere right so i'm on twitter i do a ton on instagram i i pride my instagram account on being if not the best certainly one of the best in education basically what my instagram is i you know what i learned a lot long time ago is a lot of administrators spend a lot of time on Instagram but or on Twitter, but they don't spend much time on Facebook and Instagram. I also learned that most teachers spend a lot of time on Instagram and Facebook, but they don't spend much time on Twitter. Yep. So my mentality was, let me take the best of Twitter and post it to Instagram. So that's what I do with my Instagram is I scour Twitter and I find the best tweets, the most the inspirational ones and I screenshot them, I make them look nice and I post them to my Instagram. So if you're not on Twitter and you want the best of Twitter, you can follow me on Instagram. If you're not, if you're on Facebook, so I have two pages on Facebook, right? I have, I have my new page, which I just started is my Brian Menler fan page, which I've had a hard time with Facebook trying to figure out how to create a fan page. I don't know if it's me or what it is, but I have like a regular personal page and I have a fan page. Follow I'm asking you, follow my fan page. I already have the limit. They give you a limit of friends you can have on a personal page. So I'm not allowed to have any more friends. So I can, you can go to my fan page. And what I do is my, um, my Instagram will go to that. So if you want the best of Twitter, go to Instagram. If you're not on Instagram and you want the best of Instagram and Twitter, you can follow my Facebook page and you can get everything there. So we got you covered all three places. And then all of my podcasts are also on my YouTube page. So if you want to uh, listen to or watch my YouTube, my, my podcast, um, this is Dave's podcast, Lasting Learning Podcast, which I love it, by the way. I love, I love getting to listen to you because I know no matter who you're talking to, you and I have the same mentality. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 we look alike, but we have the same mindset. And I've known that since the minute I met you was, you know, you're the same as me. You care about kids first in your life. And that's just what you are and who you are. And, and it takes a lot to get in the way of that for you. And you're going to have to, someone's going to have to really force you to, to get in the way of that. And I, that's me. Right. And so, um, you know, this is yours, but I have a podcast. It's the Brian Mellner show. It's every new episodes come out every single Monday. You can subscribe anywhere you get your podcast. We just hit over 200,000 downloads, which is amazing. And I'm, I'm proud of that. And I never knew that it would be that when I started it, it was just for me, a platform to get to talk to of the amazing people that I meet all over the country and, you know, hear their stories, which is what you do on your show for that. I didn't get to do that really. Maybe I'll come on again and I'll, I'll do more when this whole thing is over. Yeah. We can talk about something else, you know, but, um, but hearing their stories and the inspiration of where they've come from. And, you know, to me, that's the best thing about what we do and, and taking the, that into the classroom then and, and showing kids how you can persevere through tough things and hard times to me, there's really not much better. So I appreciate it, man. Absolutely. And just people, if you were listening to this and you are not subscribed to the Brian Miller show, you are missing out. It is, <laughs> it seriously gets me through more workouts than probably any Thanks, podcast dude. out there, man. Just you're, you resonate through my head all day and all week because not only are you telling stories, you're giving just nuggets of truth that inspire and motivate people cool. to keep going, keep changing and keep growing. Well, hope you, hopefully you figure out how to do those workouts from home. Cause you know, all the <laughs> right? those nuts. You know, it's scary times, man. You own a gym, you own a bar, you own a restaurant. I feel for you guys. I feel for you. I get your pain. I hear your pain. I feel your pain. And I'm trying to support you. I'm, I'm doing whatever I can to, 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 to support you and to, to buy from my local restaurant right now and to, you know, and not to use Grubhub, who I know likes to hammer the restaurants. I like, you know, Grubhub takes a significant, I don't know if you've seen this, there's a thing going around showing you how Grubhub basically they've quote unquote waived their fees, but they're charging the restaurants and a bunch of other places, but to really support the local ones, the ones who are dying out right now, because people are not allowed to go patronize them. And, you know, let's not let that, let this be for long y'all let's, let's all decide that we're going to put a cap on how long we're going to allow this to be our lives before we all say time out. We're done sacrificing for our kids, for our elderly. We got to make the kids the priority, the number one focus and get them to be happy first. And once they're happy, then we focus everything else in our society off of that versus making them really upset and miserable because they got to be home for, you know, our day. It's like Groundhog's Day, day after day after day. Are you feeling that yet, Groundhog's Day-ish? It, it's, it's crazy that uh, we're at a place where kids have truly only been home for four or five days but it feels like it's been four or five months. It it's doesn't it? insane. It doesn't really is. It? I, I think it's just that uncertainty. 
That's why the thought of you clo- of, of them closing for the rest of the year, like I can't handle a week, y'all. Like I can't <laughs> handle a week. I'm I'm losing my mind after a week. Please, you cannot close them for the year. Like, what are you doing? Time out. Like, let's build a special spot and we'll we'll do a sleepover where they all stay there. We'll quarantine them all, but don't for good for the good of everybody in our society. Please don't cancel school for the rest of the year. Please. I'm not telling you what well, you might not come to that. It might come to that, but be patient, man. There's no rush now. We're already off. There's no rush. Take it a day at a time, like we do in addiction recovery. A day at a time. Look at the information. Listen to the, st- the facts, the factual statistics, not the hysteria, not the, you know, I think there's some media who, look, people are home all day. They're watching TV all day, right? That's good for ratings, you know? I'm not interested in that. I want to know exact facts. You know, the other day I was watching an ABC story on this at night and it was a, you know, a little bit of a hysteria story. And, and, and I jumped out of bed at the eighth fact, which was the eighth fact was that I forget exactly what it was, but it was something like 99.7% of the people who have died were 85 and older and, and, and had pre-existing health conditions. Not who got sick, but who wow. died. And I looked and I listened, I jumped out of bed and I said to my wife, that should have been the first thing. Like, why isn't the lead story 99.5 of you, percent of you out there will be perfectly fine? Like 0.5%, whatever the number is, go lead with lead with what most people are gonna be versus the one or two. And I I think we all have to be, I'm the same. I buy into it, right? I you listen to it, you read it, it gets you worked up, you you immediately start to panic and think, well, this is gonna happen and that's gonna happen. And I'm not saying it is or it isn't. What I'm saying is we all have to maintain rationality during hard times. And it's a really hard thing to do, I think, you know? True story. True story. I, I appreciate Thanks, you always bringing the truth and it's always <laughs> being real, man. That's something yeah. I can count on with you. Anytime. Honestly, so. Good to see you, man. We'll do mine next. You got it.